Okie doke. Looks like we're live. Hopefully, when people start showing up, they can let me know whether they can hear me just fine or not. Alrighty. If you are out there, leave a thumbs up and drop something in the chat to say hello. This fired up. Hello, everyone. Boo. Angel Pindretti, hello. Mr. Crawford, glad to see you present. Magadwell, hello, hello. Good to have you all here. So this is just going to be one of those, you know, low budget streams. Um, nothing super special. Uh, I'm not, you know, not giving anything away or any of that good stuff this evening. I'm actually working on a client's order, which is a copper baptismal bowl. Um, this is a lot bigger than what it looks on camera because of the way optics work. And this, this, bap, this baptismal font here is 22 inches around in diameter. And I figured I would take and, uh, you know, share a little bit about flame painting copper. I get asked it all the time. Um, comments come up and questions about flame painting copper. So I figured I'd just do a do a short live tonight or long. We'll see how long we, we go at it uh, while I busy uh, work at this. So, yep, giving that knowledge away for free, right, on YouTube. That's how she works. <laughs> oh, Joshua Potter, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed my work. Bob, b, b Forge, good to see you. Evening. Virgin Ironworks, hello, hello. Jeff Killian, hello, hello. Good to have everybody um, here this evening, and more and more people are showing up, so that's awesome. As you can tell, it's a bit later of a live stream than what we normally do them, and it's a lot more low budget because we're just using the cell phone this evening <coughs> as I work. Oh, but glad to have everybody here anyhow, so... And uh, yeah, we'll get right into it here. So as I said, this is, we're going to be working on flame painting this copper bowl. And uh, I call it a copper bowl. It's a baptismal. It's just a very large bowl, essentially. Um, you know, it's just deeper and it's larger. It's used for baptisms. And so that's the only difference between just a bowl that you'd eat your cereal out of and a bowl you dunk a baby in. So, <laughs> so on this piece, I already have a, um, a coating on it of basically I've took this thing up to a nice high polish finish. And then I have went through and I have already heated this bowl up and started adding color to it. Now, what I mean by that is I've added layers of oxidization already to the piece. And now I'm, I've let it cold down. I've let it cool down, and now I'm coming back through with the torch, and I'm going to continue to bring out more and more colors. Anytime that you're using this oxidation method or flame painting as the terminology I've coined in the past, anytime that you're flame painting, you have to remember that you're working with an oxide. So you're trying to bring the colors up in layers, and the way that you do that is this oxide layers, the deeper and the thicker that you grow those oxide layers, the more true to color it's going to be after you spray paint the bowl or coat it in a lacquer or something like that to protect it in the final bed. Let me go over here. Robert Whitney, good to have you. And Wayne Heights as well. I think I saw you there. Awesome. Glad you got your Mr. Volcano. Yep, the Duncan Bowl. Awesome. And let's go fix it. Brandon. Yes. Small engines. Good to have you there. All right. So, yeah. So, that's what we're working on. This bowl has cooled all the way down. On small stuff, on smaller bowls, 
I just dunk them in water real quick to just kind of cool them and capture those oxide colors. On very large pieces like this, you, are very, uh, you risk warping the piece. So quenching it rapidly is not a good idea. So you have to bring it up to those oxide color temperatures and then let it cool and let them kind of run and develop naturally. And then you pause, you let it cool down until it's cooler than what you need. And then you stick the torch back to it and you bring it back up to temperature again. So I'm gonna go ahead and strike up here and we're gonna get after because I need to stop jawing and get this ready for the customer here. Now I will say in the stream, you are in a working man's shop. So if you see something that you don't quite agree with when it comes to safety, um, hold on to your panties. <laughs> you're just you're just cruising with Roy right now this evening. I'm a professional, I've been doing this a long time. I'm not without reproach, but I know what I'm doing by this point. The Broke A Blacksmith, I'm glad you like the shop. Richard Ironworks, yes, the price of copper is still up. I don't think it's going up, I think it's just up, period. Um, it has reached new heights that are insane. So one of the things I'll teach about flame painting as well, we'll bring this torch up here. This that I'm using is called a rose bed torch. And it, hopefully everybody can let me know if you can hear me okay. I'm gonna try to project a little bit, but not too much. I wanna blow out the speakers of the all. So hopefully this is working out okay. But this torch is called a rosebud torch. It has a half inch diameter head to it. And it has, uh, it's been a while since I counted about eight or nine uh, individual cones of flame that are putting out, you know, the main column of flame that you see here. And that's kind of that rosebud pattern is when you have more. Uh, it's called a rosebud when you have more than just one orifice that's putting out a cone or a column of flame. So this is a little bit different than if you were to use something like a welding tip, a welding tip would have only one singular little orifice in it. It would not have the multiple orifices. Anything with multiple orifices is considered a rose bud. And so that's what I've got going on here. Um, so I've got it kind of high, but kind of down as well. The reason for this being is temperature control is real important with this. Just like when you're running temper colors on a piece, that's what we're doing on copper. It's just a lot more rapid and a lot more pronounced than it is in just regular steel. So the temperature in which you hit the bowl with, that flame will dictate what type of color patterns you get out of it. Now as I heat this piece, we have a couple little interesting things happen. The propane is going to condensate. It's going to condensate on the surface of the bowl. Now you don't want to keep just driving in one spot because it'll actually create a uh, like a calcium ring or a calcite ring around it that you don't want. I'm also going to make sure it's good and blown out so there's no problem there. Now Ordinarily, to get this up to heat where I want it, I would actually take this up a lot hotter at first. I would like really rush the torch just to get it up to heat to where like, I could start changing colors, and then I would dial it back. If I do that, you guys won't be able to take and hear me. So we're just going to keep heating this until all the moisture is driven off. Now I've talked about heating up pieces and moisture being in the material or the steel. And I've had guys call me on that before and say that it's not moisture in the material, it's actually the, um, 
the byproduct with hydrogen that's coming out of the torch tip. And basically, it's the, you know, it's condensation coming from the actual torch flame itself. And if you've ever worked, if, if you've ever lived anywhere that's humid, in, like in the Northeast, um, you'll know that, yes, metal can condense, there's moisture. Um, maybe not in the material, but uh, it can de develop moisture on it without it being condensating from some other thing like a torch tip. So we're just going to keep heating it up to where the moisture doesn't stay around. And then we can start getting very specific with our colors. But by the end of the stream, I'll try to bring you guys in close and show you kind of the result. Because right now, the, right now, the light's just kind of blowing everything out. So I'll try to narrate what I'm doing. So I have some base color already in this bowl. And as I apply the new flame torch to it, that base color runs away from the flame and it exposes what looks like bare copper again. And so it's like the gases are eating away at that surface oxidization. And that's what you want because what's going to happen next is that's going to expose that steel to yet another layer of oxidization and, or you know copper in this case it's going to expose it to another layer of oxidization and then it's going to get deeper in color so we'll end up getting some crumples out of this and some dark blues even some turquoise colors so my first goal is just to heat it up enough that I cut down through that first layer, not all, not everywhere, all at once, but just in certain spots. I'm going to cut down through that first layer of oxidization. It's getting hot here. All right, now I'm pulling the flame back away. Now that I've got that, now that I've got that cut in, now I'm going to just lightly bring the flame in, just to where it starts kind of touching and affecting the surface of the material, just slightly. Now in the past, I've been able to come up. I can't do it on this project. Maybe I need to do an in-depth video. It's so hard to capture this on video, but in the past I've done stuff, I've done patterns making them look like seashells, peacock feathers, wrote my name in bowls before, wrote clients' names in bowls before with flame. And just like a painter, this is why I coined the phrase flame painting all them many years ago, or at least I believe I've coined that phrase. Probably somebody else came up with it long before I did. But just like a painter, not every brush stroke is a hard brush stroke. Some of them are very light, right, to get it in effect. And that's what you have to do with the torch. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Woo. All right. Good to see everybody. Troy, good to have you. I probably missed a whole bunch of people. Brent Messina, hello. Howdy, howdy. Let's see here. <laughs> yummy, yummy. You guys talk about food. I'm going to look it over and bring in some more heat now. I'm just waiting to start getting my color runs. I'm going to various different spots in the bowl trying to get color to run. And 
we'll see what develops out of all this. Now the interesting thing about this, the client actually requested, oh that's going to start off real nice there. Um, the client actually requested me to color both sides, both inside and outside of the bowl. You have a little bit of control to that, um, but it's kind of tricky. It's kind of tricky. You got to get it to where both uh, both sides of the bowl are kind of where you want them. And with color running to one side or the other, you know, it bleeds through. So you kind of have to play with it a lot to get the colors just right um, going back and forth. If you don't care about that, if you're just trying to get the inside of the bowl rainbow colored or outside, then the inside will turn a real dark, even color. Um, and those are probably the easiest thing to do. But to try to get it on both sides, that's a lot more difficult to do. I'm just trying to heat this up enough to get, mo get motion out of it. It being a large piece of copper, it's going to cool down relatively quick as much as it heats up. So just because it's copper, it's a really good conductor if you What I'm doing here is I'm going to different spots, almost think like polka dots, and giving it heat in different areas for different lengths of time, so that way I'm breaking up the pattern. I'll to try to get the camera in here at some point. Hopefully we'll drop the screen by doing so. It's been hot. So with, with each successive layer, what we're doing is we're slowly building it up um, over time. And that's, that's kind of the main key. We're, we're letting it build and develop character, and it's hitting those heat temperatures, and it's having time for the oxygen to interact with the surface of the material, and that's what's ultimately going to turn it our type of colors that we want. Now, if you're interested in seeing the final result of this without it being all washed out by the camera, in the late night here with the, the lights and stuff. I will be posting an Instagram photo of this. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, you should. Um, I will be doing an Instagram photo and I'll try to do a, a community post as well. I'll just snap a photo and uh, put it up there before I slam it in a box and, um, and, and ship it off to the customer. Y'all in the color runs. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Besides asking me four billion times in some other video. Where I can't answer them directly. Hi Paul Orchard. Good to see you. And Stephen Parsons. Hello. Boy, I tell you what, Troy, man. He's becoming quite the celebrity around here around these parts, which he should. <laughs> Bar Run Forge, source for copper, um, or Troy as we all know him and love him. Um, I used to have a source for copper down at the local uh, scrapyard down in Dayton, Ohio, but I do not have, uh, I don't have that source anymore because they ran out of copper. 
Uh, so the only copper that I've gotten now in the past has been at Auro Steel, and that's about the most expensive way you can buy copper. <coughs> if you don't want to go through them, um, Millennium Metals, they can get you basically just about anything, but they are quite high and quite expensive. So, you know, there's, there's those couple options. Um, there's a whole bunch of online metal places that sell copper and in various sizes and quantities. But if you're going to get a big sheet, you're going to have to go to, to the big boys, probably like a Benjamin Steel or an Alro Steel here in America to get them. And uh, be, uh, be sure to bring your firstborn to sell off. Because, <laughs> because uh, they are not cheap. They are not cheap. I can assure you they're not cheap. Just letting the flame lightly kiss the copper out at the very tip, just to let it slightly warm it. You should probably do a class on this somewhere, some point in time. It's kind of hard to do. Whichever school I'm teaching at would have to bring in a lot of torches. People would have to be proficient with torch safety and everything in order to teach one. Once you start getting the colors, kind of how you like them, it takes a hot minute to do it just right. But I better stop there, let it develop. Let's see if I can even get this to go right. Okay, we're going to go on a ride. We'll see if YouTube drops it. Let's hope not, eh? All right. Flip you around. Are you all still there? Let's hope you are.
So this is the benefit of coming in. I'm looking for these dark blues and these purples. And you start seeing some of the greens coming in. As this goes on, those will turn more turquoise in color. And as you can see, getting a deep polish, almost mere finish in this is kind of crucial. So it makes it look like a galaxy as that light reflects across it. You can even see my reflection somewhat by that shadow. See it? Can you see my reflection? So that's what we're doing to it right now. So that's what the camera is being washed out by, by all the lights. But as you can see, you can see my reflection here, mirror finish. So we got to, we still got to work on the inside and then get the outside to the same state. So just a little bit at a time. And the camera doesn't do it justice. There's a lot of subtle tones in here. And it's really only picking up the blues and the purples right now. You can see it developing. All right, so that's what we're working with. Flip her back around. Ah! High budget, I know. Go, go, go. Go back to the bowl. Uh, Lamont Atkins, have you tried using other compressed gases to cool with or heat with? Uh, I, th I think you meant heat with. Um, I have used acetylene, puts off a little bit different. It's a hotter flame and you know, you're using acetylene with oxygen. And so it's the oxygen that we're after, the heating source, not so much. Now it will affect the color outcome a little bit because there's different makeups of acetylene. There's different mixes in the acetylene as where as like in propane, there's certain dirts and there's other grime and um, oils that are in the propane that come out and affect the color as well with the oxidization. Um, now we're predominantly after the oxidate, oxidization, so the heat source isn't as much of its importance as what the temperature is and where the heat is uh, being applied. That's the main thing that matters. So, pro tip, always turn off your oxygen if you're using torches before you turn off your gas. That way it doesn't backfire. Yep, Jessica's not on the unscheduled lives. Those are mine, so. Cherokee Tinkering's good to see you here. Yeah, there's a lot of hammer blows in that one, so. There's only about eight hours of polishing, though, so. Steven Barsons just noticed Roy, his forearms look huge. Those bad boys, they're not that big. They're average size. Well, I don't know. Maybe they're a little bigger than average. <laughs> I definitely got Popeye arm. That one's nearly as big as my head. That one's not so much. So you see that one's definitely more swollen. So Popeye arms. Hi, Trail Dust. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish the rest of me was like flex worthy, but it's not. <laughs> I could jiggle the coagulated fat around. That's what I could do right now. Anywho, I'll end up losing subscribership doing that too much. Yeah, so um 
polishing the bowl is really not too bad. I mean, it is. It's a lot of work. Really, the grinding, there's a lot of grinding. There's at least two full days of grinding and sanding to get the finish right. Um, just to get to the point, just to be able to get to the point of polish work uh, with the copper. Now, most people don't go that far, but I eliminate every blemish from the forge work. So I eliminate all blemishes from the forge work in order to take and go to the polishing. Uh, I, the only thing I don't remove is the hammer mark. So if you see how the light is interacting with the surface of the material as we scrolled across it there, that's the actual hammer that's in there. So I planish it down to a point that it's smooth, but yet it still has some of that ripple, and it's for that effect for the forge work. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any point in forging these. You could just metal spin them and then do whatever the heck you felt like with them after that. So... Yep, that's right, Tim O'Connor, and full PPE as well. Um, I don't have, I don't, well, it's all put up, but I wear a mask, I wear a, uh, a face shield, I also wear a full white outfit, a uh, Tyvek suit, uh, when I do the copper. Chirpy Tinkerings, I've got one for you. Um, Roy, let's see here. Since you do copper quite a bit, have you ever dovetailed a piece and brazed it? Um, I've never dovetailed a piece. Um, I've never had to dovetail a piece of anything, really. Um, it's not my thing. Uh, but I have done brazing work on copper and um, everything from brazing work to soldering. Um, you name it like that. So, But no, I haven't ever had to dovetail a piece and braze it or silver solder or anything like that. Tim O'Connor, explain that to the people's copper allergy. Yeah, so the reason why I wear all the PPE in the world when I'm working with the copper, uh, when I am polishing, buffing, grinding, that sort of thing while working with the copper, is I actually have uh, what they call metal toxicity. And so, uh, of the blood, and it's with copper specifically. So I am now allergic to copper. Um, so that means if I get fine dust on my skin from the actual copper, I break out in hives. And it's no bueno. Um, I get itchy noses and throats and feel throat constricted and things like that. In fact, my face is a bit puffy right now. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm heavier set right now, so that's part of the puffiness, <laughs> but my face is actually puffier right now today, like especially right around my cheeks and stuff because I was actually polishing copper today, um, and not all of my face was completely covered. And so that is swollen up quite a bit for me. Um, so what that came from rusty hubcap, good to have you here. What that came from, that metal toxicity that happened to me, is because I didn't wear my PPE at the beginning of making copper work. What I did is I just said, ah, it's all right. I only just got to polish one or two things. Well, there came a year where I put out 1,000 pieces in one year, and I did them all without any respirators whatsoever, any respiration. And, you know, I get in at the end of the night and I just blow like those lime, those uh, turquoise green boogers because I had that, um, that vertigree from the copper in my lungs and in my nose and things like that. And so what that did is, you know, they say that the metal toxicity and things like that, metal fume fever, some of that stuff, it builds up, heavy metals builds up in your lungs and your blood over time. And they do, it's because your body doesn't expel these things and it takes a really long time to absorb them as well. And so it doesn't handle that very greatly. So that's what it did for me. And I started noticing that I just start breaking out in hives and I get itchy and I'd have a, a just like a terrible cold every time I polished copper or worked with copper. And then, you know, 
yeah, I started wearing PPE, but that was like a day late, dollar short uh, when it comes to that. So now I have to completely suit up head to toe um, in order to take and be able to do that. Alan's out of here. Take care, Alan. And hello, everybody who's here. Yeah, so speaking on speaking on safety real quick, I'd like to just kind of throw out a, a, a viewpoint on safety. If you're ever in my shop, I adhere to a very strict rule. My shop, my rules, right? If you don't feel comfortable with something you're doing, you have to protect you. If you don't feel comfortable with something I'm doing, you have to protect you. Uh, you don't have to protect me. I you know, if you say something like, hey, you know, that's probably not the safest. And I'm like, yeah, oh, well, then let it be. Let the guy be. And that's the same way if you're online or you're interacting with anybody on the Internet. Um, you know, it's safe to assume maybe people don't know at first when you're first meeting them. And you can mention it once. If they're not too responsive to it, then you let them have their safety on their own uh, shoulders. Right. We take our lives into our own hands each and every day. So this probably like a little safety Roy rant for you, if I will. With that being said, there is a reason for every single safety device that has ever been engineered and created on this planet. There is a reason and there is a story behind why that safety guard or safety shield or safety glasses or whatever was you know, indicated being needed in a particular item. I've seen people use uh, bench grinders without guards, with stone wheels on them, and it's because they've never seen somebody catch one of those to the face and kill them dead and outright. And so you'll see people where, you know, they're grinding on a stone wheel and the thing's running at, you know, 7,000 RPMs, and, and they're just sitting there just grinding away on something. Their shop, their rules, but you'd never see me standing anywhere near it or around it uh, when it comes to that. If they take a guard off, if it came with a guard to begin with, it is there for a dang good reason. Now, if you have to start adapting and modifying things to such a degree that it becomes unsafe in order for you to get your job done, then you're using the wrong tool for the job. So that is just my thoughts when it comes to safety. I have had to take safety shortcuts in my life. Um, I'm suffering consequences from some of those decisions. And one of those was the copper. I didn't want to spend the time. I didn't want to, well, hell at the time, I didn't want to spend the money, the little money I did, was getting in. I didn't want to spend it on safety gear. And now I have, you know, problems, right, with that already in my, in my blood system. And now I've done an insane amount of copper work in my career as a smith and so i would say <laughs> i would say more so than any of you will probably ever do and i'm not saying that to be arrogant it's just it's just honest i've done more copper work in a, in a particular condensed area of time where i was constantly inundated for 8 to 12 hours a day in copper dust fine silty copper dust where I've created, where I have now had a problem from that. So, you know, on my end, that's what it is for me. Now you, if you go out in your shop and you got this tiny little copper piece and you just want to do a real quick polish, is that going to take and hurt you any? Probably not. That's, you know, it's not something that you should freak out about. You got to wear, you know, $10,000 of PPE to polish that little bit. Put a little mask on and... You know, even if it's a paper dust mask, do your little tiny polishing and you're good to go, right? But uh, if you're going to get into it any type of seriousness, it's you're going to have to really mask up. You're going to have to really wear all the PPE. You're going to look dopey. You're going to look stupid. You're going to be uncool. You're going to have to put your nipples away by putting some clothes on, right? And that is for your own health and benefits if you care about your health in the future and you want to have any sort of longevity in it. So <laughs> Ben Toombs, I just have a stunt Smith. I love that. 
Dragon's Tongue. Grinders are not your friends. No, they are not. They'll give you a nice warm hand hug uh, real quick, like, and uh, you will regret every damn second of it. So, good seeing you, Chirpy. Take care. Sorry you can't hang around, bud. <laughs> so, yeah, another another shirt idea. You're going to have to put your nipples away. <laughs> I love it. I'm prone to saying some really retarded things, so y'all have to forgive me. Or not. So with flame painting, let's say, let's say you pass the colors that you're after. If you pass the colors that you're actually after, don't be afraid to come back in, let it cool down, and heat it all up again. That's the key to getting the colors you want out of a piece. You're just going to add another layer of oxide, and that other layer of oxide is going to deepen the look of what you're after. As long as you don't take it to a brown or a black paint, you should be good. Warm this up from the front. develop. Take care, Troy. <laughs> Glenn with his flip-flops. <laughs> Again, if you like scale on your feet, that's fine. There's a reason why. There's a, there's a reason why steel toe boots were developed. But, again, that's not always across the board. His shop, his rules, um, you know, he's sitting down, so something falling down from a seated position, maybe not as much damage. You know, a bruised toe or two wouldn't be a big deal. 
you drop an anvil on standing position onto your feet, which isn't likely, but if you drop something heavy in a shop, um, you know, might be a big difference. Another thing to talk about as well, um, a lot of best practices for safety that come into play is for professionals, for professional shops, for people who are going to be doing it like for the rest of their lives for like 35 years, right? Um, who's going to have a large exposure to safety as an issue or as a concern, as where a hobbyist or a home hobbyist is going to get exposed to that potential danger and the statistical danger of an anomaly happening to where you say something fall on your foot, right? In the case of, uh, of Glenn, that's, that's a possibility, but statistically speaking, probably not as high as somebody who would be doing it, you know, again, nine, 10 hours a day um, for 35 years, right? If you're gonna spend nine, 10 hours a day for 35 years, it's going to add up your chance, your risk, your exposure risk is a lot higher. So. Beard. I don't know if beards protect your face from a burn, but I guess if it's long enough, it can catch fire. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it worked and smelt smelt bad for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's the other thing, right? Wearing synthetics. Okay. So wearing synthetics in the forge. That has always been seen as a no-no. Why? Synthetics melt to you. That's it. They, they, they catch fire and they melt. And then they stick to your skin, and then the doctor has to pluck that out, and it takes the skin with it. Um, you know, but just as just the same, if you're wearing a leather glove and you get get that thing too close to the fire, and it starts getting really heated up, it could bake your fingers in it too, because that leather can shrink down onto your fingers if you're wearing too tight of a leather glove. Um, something more like a goat skin glove is real dangerous with that, or deer skin gloves. They will shrink all of a sudden, and you won't be able to get them off your hands, and you just have to live with it <laughs> while it's being hot. And so you'd be able to throw that, uh, you know, you should have a loose glove where you can throw the loose glove off. But again, those are some things where if you're using a loose glove and you're using it around a piece of power equipment, well, now you might just wrap your arms up in a piece of power equipment. So it's not a big broad stroke uh, brush. You can't just cover everything with gloves or no gloves, safety glass, no, well, I believe you can cover everything with safety glasses, but you know, gloves, no gloves, shirt, t-shirts or no t-shirts. It's, it, it's not a broad brush stroke uh, that you could put on there. Again, you know, if I was in India right now or during their summer, I guarantee you I'd be shirtless. <laughs> In the forge, I'd be shirtless because I can't take the heat. So I would end up having heat exhaustion before I had any worry about catching scale to the chest. <laughs> Leland Hawk. Well, you're here. Oh, um, usually we schedule out our live streams, right? We plan out our live streams. We put them out there and, um, you know, we... We do that next Friday, I believe, is our, our actual scheduled live stream. We'll be doing a giveaway and all of that jazz. Um, this is just something I want to do. I had to work late anyhow. I said, you know what? Might as well just live stream and say hello to the folks. Um, so this thing is basically at the colors that I want it to be. I'll bring you all over and look at it um, here in just a moment. As you see here, I've put a lot of effort into shop organization. So all of that over there is blanks, or all blacksmith blanks that we offer over at our website. Um, I've been working at that for quite a while to get that all organized. This way everything's where it needs to be and, uh, you know, and in good shape. And yeah, uh, there's been some other upgrades to the shop as well. 
me and Thomas has been working hard at, uh, at a special project that you all will get to see next Friday night. Yeah, no wonder you can't find any bins. Oh, yeah, they all made their way north. Oh, you're looking at... Oh, I don't know. Probably four months of gathering and waiting for them to get their bins back in stock. Um, up there, the old Harbor Freight. In order for me to take and put all of that together. <laughs> oh. What's wrong with forging barefoot? Nothing. If you like burnt toes. First time you step on a bit of welding slag because you're barefoot and it sears itself into your soul, <laughs> not just the sole of your foot, uh, then you might be like, oh, maybe that's what's wrong with forging barefoot. Yeah. S start forge weld up some Damascus and have a nice squirt of your uh, overuse of flux land on the floor and you just happen to step on it smell like a pork rind for a second oh yeah oh yeah it'll be good stuff but then again some people are braver people than me and that's okay that's okay these are roy's preferences these are not rules that you must follow the world is your oyster Psh, flip you around that's where you once were. All right. Take care, Jeff Killian. Good to see you. All right, I'm going to try to do this in the least shaky way possible. This camera does not get it or do it justice. Does It kind of, the camera on this phone, it likes to, there's a pretty good representation. It likes to flatten out the image. There we go. We're starting to get them colors that we want to get. Now, all these colors will deepen and darken when, as soon as I spray it down with spray paint. So as soon as you spray it down with spray paint or put a lacquer over it, all those colors will change. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for your kind words. As you can see there. It's a lot prettier in person. So I'll have to snap a picture. And share it over on Insta. Once it's fully done. I can get it out in daylight. Thank you, everybody. Glad you all like it. Now let me go back out. Oh, yeah. That thing over there is new. Do you all see that? That's a concrete mixer. And uh, Slash turned out into a tumbler. I'm turning that thing into a rock tumbler, basically, for uh, working on the blanks. Oh, I don't think I have any on hand that I can show you right off. But uh, basically, in the rock tumbler, they come out like a stonewashed finish, which is really nice. Just set up there. Boop. Boop -a -doop. Thank you all. Thank you all so much, by the way. Black Wolf, I hope you get to get around to it soon. <laughs> yeah. To those knives I make, uh huh. Nope. <laughs> oh, uh, Tim O'Connor. Yes, it's going. It clears off the slag really, really well, and it gives the whole blank a nice finish. Um, what we have been doing is using this magnetic chuck here and wire wheeling each and every order, and that's fine until somebody orders, you know, fifty to a hundred of something. When somebody orders fifty to a hundred of something. It takes like an hour plus to take them wire wheel all the grind, all, all the plasma slag off of the blanks. And uh, it's just, it's a nightmare. But if you guys stay right here, let me uh, take them. Well, of course, you have no choice but to stay right there. 
Let me try to find you an example of the difference. So this is just a little part. Of course, the big parts, you know, change too. Find you a good example. There we go. All right. You should be able to show this up on the camera here. Stay put. Yep, Roy is living proof. You don't need knives to draw in buyers. Oh, all right. So this, see here. Does a will the camera even focus on that? Let's see. You guys see that? Okay. Back it up a little bit right there. So you guys can see all that slag, right? Okay. You see all that slag on there? Basically plasma dross. It's just cutting dross. Well, and it's kind of rusty looking. Well, this is what it looks like when it comes out of the tumbler. No additional cleanup necessary. So this was tumbled in parts. I've got like five or six big field stones in there inside the tumbler. As you can see there, so I got about five or six big uh, field stones in there. And so it goes from that to, uh, -ba -da -ba, to that. Pretty clean, right? Pretty darn clean. So, yep, works out really well. Um, it allows me to offer a higher end product to folks, uh, you know, which I'm super excited about. Yeah, I don't have any more. They're all over there in it. Um, <coughs> I could probably pull some of those out and show you a little bit better. Give me a second. I'll go pull them out. We'll give you a little ride. Come over here and grab them out real quick. Grab one of these, come back, give me a second. Here I am again. Uh, yeah, Matthew was painting colors on the bowl. I'll show that at the end of the stream again, real quick. I'm going to do some other. Uh, uh, snapshots of it right now i'm just sharing an upgrade to the shop that i've been working on for a little bit so there you go can everybody see that okay put my I'll find a place where that's so gosh darn contrasty Does that work better let's try there that that, that, look, that looks a lot better so you guys can see that better so it's kind of rusty on the front yeah and you can kind of see the dross And this is after. This is only an hour in the tumbler. So it goes from that to that in one hour. Just like so. So I think this offers is this is a much better product to be able to offer the customers. And if anybody's wondering, this is over at our website, blacksmithingblanks.com. You can go check that out anytime you want. I'm not trying to turn this into a sales video at all. Um, I was just, you know, this is what a rock tumbler does for you. Um, again, working, the, the uh, mag block works great for those one-off orders where you just need to really quick get them out the door. But if we have the time and we're doing a big bulk um, where we're cutting a couple hundred blanks at a time, or two, three hundred blanks at a time. We need the ability to just throw them in a machine, let them kind of beat together, and do be able to go do something else with our time. Um, versus, 
you know, spend all time on the wire wheel. And I also think these look really, really great. So uh, Tinker at Forge, these are eighth inch thick material for the hooks. Um, everything we offer is basically eighth inch material, except for the flower blanks. The flower blanks are a, um, uh, they're 16 gauge material and all of our bowl blanks, all of our hook blanks, they're all made out of eighth inch or 10 gauge, depending on what we can get our hands on. I try to make them out of 10 gauge, but they don't always have 10 gauge. So we have to do, you know, uh, eighth inch. Now the only other, the, the tools are all made out of quarter inch plate. So our guillotine tools we offer and the treadle hammer kits are all out of quarter inch, cut out of quarter inch thick material. So, well, thank you, Tinker at Forge. Roy could pull an eye patch off, I think. Arg. I think I probably could, but let's not try it. <laughs> uh, Paul Orchard, no, they don't. They don't. Um, the only thing I've noticed is some of the little finer details. There are some where they have tails. I've got some new ones coming out that they're like goats and cows and things like that. I have noticed the tails will get squatted in a little bit more from where they once were by beating together. So, um it's okay. Someone's going to manipulate those anyhow afterwards. So, <laughs> Stephen Parsons. I think Roy could pull off a kilt, but he won't. Actually, me and Thomas were talking about the other day. And like, what would, <laughs> like, what, what would uh, it take for Roy to take and get in a kilt? And I said, well, you know what? I said, I'd start a GoFundMe first. That's what it'd be. So it'd be a GoFundMe, and it, I would have to have $100,000. That would be the goal, $100,000. And for $100,000, I would wear a kilt for 365 days without a break. That means I would go ice fishing in the winter in a kilt. I would wear a kilt to all the festivals and shows and teaching gigs and everything else I've got going on. I would wear a kilt for 365 days. So... And, I, you know, hell, I would even have it embroidered somewhere, I don't even know, on the male fanny pouch that comes with it. I don't even know what a kilt comes with. <laughs> I would have it embroidered, <laughs> bought and paid for by <laughs> the subscribers of Christ Centered Ironworks, you know. So, <laughs> so I thought that was funny. I was like, yeah. I'm like, that's, that's how we would do it. Roy would have to get paid at least a hundred thousand dollars and i would wear it for an entire year oh xavier uh said with the new air attachment for the treadle hammer you might need concrete flooring <laughs> i might it's beating that little anvil into the ground pretty good i need to readjust that anvil up a little bit higher yeah <laughs> mr crawford if only we could get a hundred thousand. So right now we just passed 87,000 subscribers on the channel. And so if everybody put in a dollar and 14 cents, one dollar and 14 cents in the kitty, boom, baby, we've got it. <laughs> See, you got to be Alex Steele level big in order to pull in any sorts of numbers like that. You know what a hundred grand could do for me around here? A lot. I'd pay somebody else to fix my roof. That's what I'd do. Instead of me having to crawl up there. <laughs> Dan Harold, I'm glad the gas forge tips helped you out. Yeah, you had my hopes up for nothing. Roger Caldwell. That, yeah, he's been buying uh, so flower hooks for me for from me to do the Alzheimer's uh, thing. Very awesome. That right there. Yes, I'm a country, country man, man's van, mountain man, that sort of thing. Oh. <laughs> I know, it's strange, right? It's strange. Don't tell no one. I'll be demonetized for sure, for life. Kicked from platform. 
oh well, I'll just go back to be, <laughs> I just go back to being the 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 anti-social, uh, anti uh, uh, establishment, Roy. There you go. <laughs> Yep, in the barn. That's the uh, that's the mouse getter. And squirrel, and rabbit, dove, pigeon, other varmints that like to invade my shop from time to time. Well, for early honor forge. Hello, snakes. Yeah, yeah, snakes too. I try to leave any of the animals, I, I try not to mess with them too much, but I give them a good stiff talking to and a warning. Wayne Hines, still waiting for your Lumberjack series. That is coming eventually. Hopefully. <laughs> oh, I've got some plans for a full-fledged, um, uh, I, I want to make out make a full-fledged broad axe in order to take and do the work that I want to do. And there's also a, like a hewing uh, hatchet that I want to make as well and you know and I need to do all of that before I build my sauna house so I want to build a sauna house up here and also a smoke house and I want to be able to do it timber framed style and then add some iron accents those will be longer video projects I don't know when I'll get around to everything that I want to do on those so winter short films Roy in the woods. Yeah, I need to come up with a different one. So, Matthew Montgomery, uh, favorite tool in the shop. So right now, uh, my favorite tool in the shop is our new treadle hammer kit that we offer over our website. Um, no joke, not a sales tactic. It's just it's fun as heck um, to play with, and so that's that's been my favorite uh, tool as of current, um, just because I've been so tickled pink with how it has turned out. And I like, uh, you know, I don't know. I just like using it. It's, it's a heck of a lot of fun. And so, yeah. Yeah, that's right now currently my favorite tool in the shop. Uh, prior to that, I would just say Olga, my anvil. I love my anvil. Yep. Yeah, can't be a live stream. No snow. <laughs> yeah. No snow. Can't do that. Can't do that. So, well, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys something really cool. If it cuts out, it's because of the building. We're, we'll see where it go. But well, I'm going to show you something really cool in the other room real quick. So we're going to actually go over to the forging area, and then I'll bring you back here before the live stream's over with and try to show you this bowl. If I don't get around to it, I will post a picture on the community tab and also on Instagram. So, we're gonna go over in the other room. Let me disconnect some air over here real quick. Reconnect some other air. Might as well turn you all around so you can see what I'm doing. My fancy air set up here. <laughs> it's all super high tech, super professional folks around here at Christ Center Ironworks. Very top class. Har, 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 har. Thank you, Matthew Montgomery. Will do. Um, Roy, how is the little anvil face holding up on your treadle hammer? Um, it is, it's got a little waller spot in it because I've been striking it with a 12 pound sledge without any steel underneath it. So probably shouldn't do that much more. <laughs> oh, all right, well, let's hear. Flip her around. All right, can you guys handle this? I'm gonna try to be as smooth as possible. No promises. Closing this up. Doo, 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 doo. Let's walk through the shop. Little live tour. Ah, don't cut out, don't cut out, don't cut out. All right. Yeehaw. Hopefully I'm not cut out yet. Are we still good? Bam. Hopefully we're still good. Still live? Yeah, we're still live. Okay. So I just recently added that to the mix. 
we've started to add the logo into the side of the treadle hammer kits pieces. So now it has the Christ Center Ironworks logo or a simplified version into the side of the treadle hammer kits. So that's pretty cool. That's been a new adjustment. Also, do you all notice some new lumber right there? You know what you also know? Walk over there real quick. Guess what that is? That, my good friends, means no more This means no more seeing the outdoors. No more snow in the winters. So now I have officially, that's what me and Thomas has been working on. We have been siding everything. What about skylight? No skylight. In fact, let me, let me try to loosen this up, turn you smoothly. So there's the metal at the back of the building. You can see the metal where the old hole used to be, right there, up in our loft. So that has been no small feat to put that up. That's why I've been slacking on videos. I've put metal siding up now on the barn, on the outside, to preserve the barn for future generations and the inside of this look. Because is this not gorgeous? I believe this is absolutely gorgeous and worth preserving. So there you have her. Just like so. So does this mean I'm not going back to coal? Uh, I will be going back to coal. That's the next build that we'll be working on. I'm going to be putting in a stone hearth. Move you guys all over here. Again, I apologize. Hopefully the phone won't cut out. Have any problems. No lag. Bam. There we have it. So yeah, so that's that's what's been new. So I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Thomas Goodymoot. Um, he was the guy instrumental in helping me get the siding on. Um, what a huge task. Uh, we ended up with nine sheets left over out of 60. So there was 51 sheets of steel, 16 foot by three foot wide, 50, uh, so 51 of them is what we hung to put up on this barn. So that was a lot of work over the last couple weeks. So yeah, I'm gonna do the, I'm gonna do the stone, uh, stone hearth. That's what I'm gonna be doing. And I've got a really cool plan for that. I've already got all the stone uh, in. It's actually laying in my driveway. I just have to dig the footer and the foundation and do all that work. And I plan on doing a full video on that as well um, and become a stonemason for a short bit, which ought to be a ton of fun. And then everybody, somebody was asking, yes, that is a color changing light in the background with the logo on there. We like that for there. So 51 holy purple cow butter. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 51. 51 sheets at 16 feet long. Uh, it took a lot. So it's 32 feet. For those of you who don't know, it's 32 feet to the peak of the barn. I'll lower you all down here a little bit. I just wanted a different place to go sit instead of inside the other barn area there. 
But yeah, if you look up there, it's 32 feet to the peak. Those lights sit at 16 feet off the ground. Drew Olson, thank you so much. God bless you. And uh, good luck with moving the heavy equipment tomorrow. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Tim O'Connor for the back door. I greatly appreciate that. God bless you, brother. Thank you for the $2 super chat. Uh, Roger Caldwell, uh, it is not an old to uh, uh, tobacco barn. It is an old dairy barn. So um, they used to have the, the milking stations and everything was in the, uh, what I'm calling the welding or fabrication side of the shop. This looks weird. I need to straighten out my camera angle here a little bit. There we go. Thank you so much, Chris Griffin. So yeah, so where we were at previously working on the copper bull, um, in there, that stoned in area, that was the milking place. They actually have the old poop trough in the floor that, you know, excrement could go out and extra milk and stuff in there. Um, that is in one side of the barn. I keep that where I do all the metal fabricating and stuff. And then out here is where they would stare, store all of their hay, um, and or tractors or equipment or things related to doing dairy cows. So this used to be a dairy farm. Um, now it's got split up over the last oh, 100 years or so. And so when I bought the place, I bought it with 8.8 .8 acres. And, um, you know, and it was mostly the, the barn, my house, 8.8 .8 acres, 8.8 .8 acres around it that used to be pasture um, for the dairy. Yep. Many, many, many years ago, back when they milked them by hand. <laughs> Joy Blessed Life, hello. <laughs> for the honor for, did you put Harbor Freight anvils on your fly press handles? That may be the best use I've seen yet besides, besides as a starting kit for someone. Um, no, those are actually what they call pro-grade anvils. Um, they're not professional grade at all. They're just a cast iron anvil that you get can get on Amazon and the like. And uh, those are two 25-pound anvils up there. I actually got a video on it where I put those up. Uh, adds a lot of thumb, and I think they look, I think they look really, like, stupid cool. Let me go back here and flip them a bit here. Do, do, put on some light as well. Give me a little extra light in here. All right. I just think they look cool going round and round. Now I've been said it's been said a couple times, Roy, you're gonna nail your head on those things. Um, that's a safety hazard. Wouldn't want to be your eyebrows. Well, as you can see here, look how high those anvils are. Very, very high. So the anvils are way up off the ground. I'm never gonna have a split brow on these, um, but yeah, they add a lot of thumpage, which is really, really good. <laughs> All right, what do we got here? Stephen Parsons, a Harbor Freight anvil would make, be perfect for the exploding anvil mess. Um, yeah, I would love to take and do that. Um, I actually have a couple. I have a couple Smith bustings. I'm gonna have to see if that can be if, if that's a trademark thing or not. If I can use a variant of that because, you know, Mythbusters, they had their thing and I would not want to get sued by somebody bigger than us. Um, so, you know, maybe I could do the Smith busting thing as a series, but I, I have a couple things I want to <laughs> play out and test that are basically just old wives tales in the blacksmithing field that continue to get regurgitated as incorrect information. So, so yeah, that's basically it. Uh, there's not a whole lot else to tell as far as new in the shop. I have been so busy and so consumed with just keeping up with orders that are coming in. And praise God for each and every last one of you out there that have uh, purchased CNC blanks from us. Um, it has made this whole process of getting this barn closed in so much better um, and less stressful. So I can't complain at that at all. So thank you for that. Um, we've been... 
so we've been hustling at doing that. And whenever we haven't been doing that, we've been hanging steel on the sides of the barn uh, to try to get it prepped and ready for winter. And uh, so that's that's been a huge undertaking. Um, lots of scaffolding set up and a lot of time spent way up, way up high. So, uh, so I have not had a time to do anything. Tim O'Connor, take care, brother. Uh, we'll see you next Friday night as well. Thank you for being here and thank you for always being a supporter. Greatly appreciate it. So yeah, um, so I have not been very busy making videos, which really sucks. And I'm sure plenty of subscribers have been like, eh, I'm getting out of here. This guy's not making any cool content anymore. Well, that's why I've been so busy. <laughs> I've been so slammed out busy uh, with the barn, uh, you know, fixing the shop up. Uh, so I don't get snowed on this winter. And I can spend more time in the shop now that I'm not getting, you know, the wintry, weathery blast all the time, so. Ooh, I like that. For the Honor Forge. Smith Myths, Cracked Up Opinion, or Solid Truth, the series. Ooh, I like the last one. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> Might be a bit pretentious, but I'll do it. Yeah, I like that one really good. I did think I saw, came in here, it's been a hot minute. Yeah, Tim Cunningham. By the way, Tim Cunningham is a really cool dude. You guys should follow him out on uh, social as well, over on Instagram. And you should also follow him on YouTube. Really cool guy. Big supporter as well. So anyways, yeah, so that's that's what I've been up to. I know, kind of boring, right? Um, that's about it. Uh, it was very, very, very time consuming. I look forward to getting back to a video series on, ooh, yeah, no, I can show that. Give me a second. I'll go grab it. I have, I'm sitting on Olga, by the way, ha <laughs> ha. Harold Hoskinson. Hoskinson. La, sorry, can't talk this evening. Talk about tooling for the Roy Hammer. I will have to do that. <laughs> the Roy Hammer. But uh, I want to talk about this real quick. So I have a video, it's going to be a probably a four-part series. I really don't want to take and do a four-part series on it, but there's just no other way of fitting the amount of uh, visual information that I would like to do in one, one video. I might make a really short, condensed one that's like, you know, 18 minutes long, but uh, uh, I plan on doing a four-part series on making this. So this is something that's been on the back burner. I had to take a bit of a break from this because... Um, uh, I've been forging, uh, again, I've been working on the siding, so. so there you have it there. So this is a decorative door knocker. This is what I like to call like a French Baroque door knocker. Forged in a very classical style. And so I've got a lot of stuff to go with that and, and to do, so. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. Let me answer real quick. Dragonstone Gym and Ironworks, Mr. Crawford. Yes. Do you, do you reckon with the siding you'll have to install a roof vent? Um, the barn is still very open. So all the eaves, they haven't, nothing's been boxed in on the outside of my barn. So I don't have a fascia and a soffit. So it's still open to get up underneath there and in the purlins. And so it's still a fairly open barn. Um, as far as that is concerned, but I will have to install a vent as soon as I get my, uh, as soon as I get my large um, stone hearth installed. When I do that, I plan on, that's how I'm going to set my hood that is going to connect to my vent pipe that's going to go up through the roof, since it is so tall. 
Yeah, the fishtail scrolls really pop. Thank you. Matthew Montgomery, thank you. I'm glad you like it. Leland Hawk, yep, you just got to keep working on it. Well, let's talk about extravagance when it comes to steel. So, yeah, it's going to be awesome, Thomas. It's going to be awesome. For those of you who don't know, Thomas Goodymoot that's in the chat, he has been helping me um, three days a week here in the shop and uh, is a staple around here now. So um, couldn't do it without him. And he's also a great friend of mine. So, oh, yeah. So let's talk about, real quick, let's, let's talk about elaborateness in ironwork, right? Th something like this to just start an approach to approach this just as a whole is very scary and can look quite intimidating. But you have to break something like this down to what it is, right? To what it is. What this is, is a, an amalgamation of multiple parts. So yeah, everybody, let's go Thomas. That's right, right on Thomas. Everybody sell, say hello to him real quick. Um, yeah, and again, instrumental in putting on the siding. I couldn't have done it without him. So yeah, everybody give him a round of applause for sure. So this particular piece, there's this center portion. That's this fishtail scroll part and this snub in scroll with the fluting and stuff. That center portion, that whole center portion is one piece forging. The collar is one piece. The scrolls are technically two pieces. So it's one, one piece here, two pieces here. One piece here, one piece here, right? So, so this is one piece that's bent back on itself and scarfed and forge welded. And then one piece here that then becomes a set of two and it gets welded onto the main bar. So something like this, if you break it down to its simplest elements, it becomes easier and easier to understand how to do. And show a little bit on the back side, you can see those lines there. I actually forge welded that pretty good on the back side too, so it um, doesn't show as well. So, but yeah, you can take you can take the most complex pieces of forging that you see in the world, and you can break them down to their smallest elements, and just work on perfecting each one of those tasks, and then add those perfected pieces to each other to create the final piece. And that's how all big forgings go. That's how any gate I've ever made or any railing I've ever made or any anything, sculpture I've ever made, that's how I've made those things and been able to do them is just to be able to look at a piece or design a piece and break it down to its simplest elements in little bite-sized chunks. Um, you know, how do you move a mountain? One shovel full at a time. I love it. The support of the community. I love that. Thanks for supporting Thomas as well. Yep, Wayne Heinz, that is correct. A whole bunch of fundamental pieces all put together. And, you know, you choose many different ways of doing it. I chose to forge weld these together. These could have been brazed on. Um, these could have been riveted on. There's a lot of different ways you could do this. These could be individual pieces, like individual scrolly pieces that are all then just pinned together and riveted on. There's a whole lot of different methods. I forge welded everything, um, but there you go. Pretty simple, right? Uh, yeah, Elephant 101, right? Same thing. Um, you know, you can use any analogy you like, but that's how it is. Yeah, Wayne Heights, I have a, I have a whole video series on mastering the fundamentals. Um, scroll work, the actual fundamentals, um, and even traditional joinery. So I've got multiple playlists and multiple series on stuff like that. So definitely, you know, just take it one step at a time and you can do that, you know? And uh, sometimes you'll realize that, um, especially once you're good and you've mastered the fundamentals of things, you'll find that you add too many things that you're kind of like, eh. I shouldn't. 
it's like this is going to take me a week of Sundays to <laughs> to get this accomplished, and I don't have that much time. So it's really easy when you're at the drafting board to draw a bunch of doodles. Say, oh yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah. And then you may be able to do that, but you'll be hating yourself <laughs> in the long run. So, Catherine uh, McGillagrave or Joe McGillagrave uh, here. Thanks for the hammer kit and air assist. They both work great. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name Gillivre. I don't know. Joe, thank you. I'm glad that it's working out great. So, Xavier, take care, brother. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Harold Hodgkin, uh, I will do my best. I will put out, I, I'll do my best to put some sort of material list in there or at least explain it in text this time, kind of just talk about the starting, uh, starting stock sizes that I'm working with. Um, Chris Griffin, can't wait to learn stonework. Awesome. Me either. <laughs> oh, I know a little bit about stonework, um, only from some stonemasons I've hung out with in the past. Uh, not a ton. Uh, I have not done a ton of it myself. So this will be a big learning curve and experience, and I plan on sharing the journey uh, with everybody else. So I've read up on stonework. Um, and again, like I said, I've had some friends in the stoneworking uh, stonemasons that I've talked to in the past. And I feel pretty comfortable undertaking the project. Yep, that's right. Don't learn the don't learn the project, learn the processes. Yeah, you can make practice parts. Okay, Mac Gill Livray, right? Mac Gill Livray, Mac Gill Livray. Got it? Did I get it right? <laughs> I think I was calling you gravy. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> That's so wrong. McGilla gravy. <laughs> I apologize. Matt Gillivre. Matt Gillivre. 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 I'll get it. I'll get it eventually. And I'll still screw it up during a live stream. Just you watch. <laughs> it's, I'm bad. Awesome. Got it perfect. It's from your great typing there, sir. From your great typing. Uh, what type of stone am I using? I'm using field stone. So um, no river stone or anything like that. I don't want a ton of moisture in it. Um, it's all going to be field stone. Round. Nothing flat, round. So there's going to be nice big round stones for my stone hearth. I think it's going to come out looking really cool. <laughs> okay, it's Kathy. Thank you, Kathy, for typing it out so well. <laughs> somebody's talking about a devil in somebody's closet. I don't know what that's all about. Anyways, so yeah, it's going well. Um, somebody asked about the Lawler spot. How's that going? I believe it was you, Mr. Crawford. You were asking about that. Let me flip you around. Big finger on you there. See, these unscripted live streams are where to go to see all sorts of content you never wanted to see. I don't know if you guys can see it there. Right there, there's a little bit of a waller spot. Right where the hammer kind of comes down and hits. There's an apex of the hammer right there that hits right there. And that is all because, simply, that, that is all because of me coming out and testing it. So that's what that's for. <laughs> so I should probably do more testing. This is why people use wood sticks, right? Something like that.
Voilà. Smashy. Smashy. I need it to be flatter. <laughs> like I said, it's like my most favorite tool in the shop right now. Yeah, making Olga jealous. Yeah, basically beating that sucker right down in the ground, though. It's got a bit of a lean to her now. I think the uh, adhesive in the stand has slipped loose. So, do you see it? Do you see how leaning it is? And actually, you may not be able to see it that well, but right here, there's a crack in it. There's a crack in one of those six by six treated timbers. So, yeah, I've been whaling, this, whaling the snot out of it. Yeah, it hits a small area, doesn't it, Leland Hop? But yeah, that is a bright side. So that's basically it. Um, yeah, I, uh, I added the logo um, to those things, put in brand new steel on the siding, um, thanks to Thomas Goody Moot. Um, that's been real great. Ooh, yeah. And last little update thing, we'll go look at that bowl. And then I'll probably call it an evening. That way everybody can go to bed. But uh, still doing, I need to get back to it, but I'm still doing the comparison testing between the single burner, Mr. Volcano, and the double burner, Mr. Volcano. So I'll still be working at those videos yet. Uh, I've got some more testing to do and showcase those things and how they work and all of that good jazz. So let's take you on a ride, shall we? <laughs> don't freak out, don't freak out, YouTube. Don't freak out through the shop. Never ending nonsense we go. Ah! Okay, get back over here. We've got good enough. That's now boom, boom, boom. Ugh. All right. Isn't that a nice squash plant? Such a nice squash plant. All right. One last showing of the bowl here. Making me sick. Sorry, Rotten Art by DK. So there you go. This is what she looks like. I'm trying to pull it back. Like I said, I'll do a finished photo online soon as I can get some good light tomorrow to do it, I'll show it off. I'm not even going to attempt the bottom. But there you have it. That's a flame painted bowl. There's a lot of character underneath. So that is a baptismal font done with flame painting. Well, it's best I can show that off. Not to do a shabby. Thank you so much, everybody, for saying it's outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's all right, Thomas. This was a one guy deal, basically, working on this bowl. So, greatly appreciate it, though. You did a lot of the heavy lifting on the grinding, so it's greatly appreciated. <laughs> yeah, sewer bowl for Jethro. So, does anybody else um, Yeah, Leland Hawk. Yeah, the, the bowl blanks are quite huge. So what? So, uh, does anybody have any questions on flame painting before I let you all go this evening? The Speedy Mechs, I'm glad you like the videos. 
thank you for being here and visiting with us. Uh, Paul Orchard, anyone heard from Chandler? Um, as far as I know, Chandler's not doing video. Well, he's not doing any videos anymore. Um, I don't know why, uh, other than maybe he's just tired of it and got off the platform. Um, I used to watch Chandler Dickinson all the time myself. I thought he was a cool dude. Lots of fun. But uh, I haven't talked to him in a long while, and that's pretty sad. Oh, yeah, um, you know, it's 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 a funny thing, YouTube, right? Kennard Christensen, very welcome. Um, it, the, YouTube, YouTube is a very interesting platform, right? Uh, you know, we all start on YouTube with our own reasons, right? Our own reasons for starting a channel. Um, you know, maybe with big goals or lofty goals, getting with different people, you know what I mean? Uh, that, you know, some of us get on here for the social connection. Some of us get on YouTube because, well, I mean, some people just get on YouTube because they have a product to sell. Some people get on YouTube because they want to become famous. Some people get on YouTube because they want to share information or they want to be a teacher, an educator, um, or be respected in the space. Um, for whatever they are. Some people just want to get on YouTube for videography. And everybody has their own little reason for getting on YouTube. And what happens with YouTube after a while, and I've been on it long enough to take and probably start speaking to this a little bit, is, you know, it grates on you after a little while because things in YouTube don't always seem fair. Some of it feels like it's rigged against you. And then it just takes really a bad month of like super hard trolling comments to come through and it can really affect your mental health in a bad way that uh, human beings were just never meant to process that uh, that amount of much of hate and debauchery and things like that we were never meant to do that so so it's very it, it, you know people get onto youtube for all sorts of different reasons um, i think chandler he got on youtube because he liked to share right he was wanting to share stuff um and you know hopefully I mean, yeah, uh, Stephen Parsons, unfortunately, Chan Chandler was going to, I think, a deep, dark depression stage. Yeah, and, and he was getting into depression and stuff and the, um, the pressure to constantly put out content. And then when you put out content, if you haven't done it in a long while, like, like every time I like if I took I, when we moved up here, I took like a two month break, almost a three month break from YouTube. And when I did that and I come back, I lost a bunch of subscribers um, all of a sudden as soon as I started posting a video. Now, I eventually, you know, got some back, but it was right around the same time that YouTube did a big purge of all the bot accounts that are out there. And so it made my numbers look like they got hit even worse by me coming back um, after I had moved. And it was just like, oh, you know, and, and you work so hard to be, um, to be where you're at on YouTube, I would guess you would say to to have a following, to to teach. That's my effort, right? I'm trying to do a lot of education and teaching and blacksmithing, and, and be influential and help a lot of smiths out there. That's my main thing. It's more of the charitable stuff. That's what I'm into. And when you get into that, and then all of a sudden it's just like it nose dives on you. That can affect you real bad. And Satan has a way of just throwing all the evil, hateful comments <laughs> right at you at about the same time. And so you have to learn to get a pretty tough skin real quick. And uh, pretty quick. Oh, I'm not a thin-skinned person, but YouTube is a weird... Uh, such a weird thing. Because someone can say a comment when you're not ready, right? It's almost like somebody coming up and kicking you in the homeboy's when you weren't clenched up yet, right? Where you didn't see it coming. You're just walking, minding your own business, thinking you were doing something good and charitable, and then, bam, out of nowhere, somebody hits you and karate chops. Watch out! Your mind. Um, and you, it, you're you just not prepared for it. And, and, you know, it's one of those things, like, the, the human fight or flight response system doesn't kick in until it's much too late and the damage has already been done. And so if you struggle with depression, if you struggle with uh, mental health issues and a lot of things like that, YouTube is brutal. Um, it is brutal for you. 
So I hope Chandler, last time I heard about Chandler Dickinson is that he was doing well. He just wasn't doing YouTube anymore. So. <laughs> ben Toombs, correct, Roy? That's why I can make fun of myself more than anyone. Yep, you got to be able to let the, be, be a duck and let it roll off your back if you can. Let's see here. Uh, cannot Qualto should. Not sure how you pronounce that. So, um, yeah, <coughs> I do believe that bears that out about being created in God's image and, and it drives us to create beautiful things. Um, I, I believe that that can bear that out. I believe we seldom take that advantage to take and actually do that. I, I believe a lot of times we spend too much time trying to break others down or break things down or be destructive and destroying things. So, Leland Hawk, I'm glad that it takes and helps you uh, with that. So, yeah. And, you know, and that's a huge thing, Leland. Um, you know, you never know who you're going to, uh, you know, help, even in the smallest ways. And, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't profess that I'm out here uh, really helping anybody. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I just try to take and live a life that, uh, you know, where I can help other people. And I do care. And I think, I think all my earlier years of YouTube, I've, I have found that it's harder for me to express the appropriate emotions at the correct times to do them. And so, so everything, if like, if I'm hurt, it usually comes out as rage first. And I'm learning that about myself is, you know, if someone hurts my feelings, it usually comes out as rage, first and foremost. And then later on, then it's like, uh, I go through like grief stages. So it starts with rage and anger. Then it goes with basically depression. And then it comes with a certain amount of numbness afterwards. Um, and then I'm okay. And I'm back as right as rain. But I've, I've learned that to like, not get, let people get my goads as much on YouTube. And it's very, you know, it's difficult, uh, you know, to do that because there's so much more at stake, right? You know, who needs me adding to the drama pile of the world, adding more negativity out there in the world? Um, nobody. That's, that's just the answer. The world's negative enough as it is. And it's not a good representation of Christ. It's not a good representation of who the man I want to be and, you know, the friend I want to be. And so it takes it takes a long time on YouTube to kind of start getting that sorted out. So if you watch a lot of the other, a lot of my older, older videos, um, you know, some of them could get quite spicy. And part of that was because I felt hurt by things that people had said to me. And it came out as anger first. And I just happened to have a camera rolling, which is a bad idea to, to do that. So hat. What about the question about the hat? Uh, the hat is Western Artist Blacksmith Association. Take care, Thomas. Good to have you. So yeah, so you know, there's plenty of um, there's plenty of people that have been inspired by my work, which I still don't know how to feel about. There's plenty of people that have been helped through tough and difficult circumstances by my work on YouTube. Again, I don't know how to feel about that myself. I'm just thankful. I, I guess I'm, I'm, it humbles me a lot. It does. Um, you know, ultimately, I'm just some weirdo out on the internet um, <laughs> posting videos from my shop. And, you know, I don't, I neither deserve anybody's attention or time or gratitude. I don't deserve any of that. But yet I'm here. And, um, you know, I'm certainly appreciative of everybody that, you know, has supported me 
in this endeavor of what we're doing here on the channel. And I hope to just continue to do this long, long in the future and, you know, not listen to the negative voices, right? There was one guy I actually just, um, he was asking for it. He was basically begging to be deleted and blocked. Um, so I ended up giving him what he wanted after a while. And I've given this guy many a chances on the channel. And I look back across all of his comments on the channel. And for the last eight times he commented on the channel, <coughs> the history of his comments on the channel, he was always um, uh, very super negative. And, and I don't mean negative in a way of like, oh, you know, life sucks. What was me kind of thing. I'm talking like negative as in personal attacks to me personally about my character. And, you know, last one I was trying to get in this, I was starting to get in this bit of a squabble. And, you know, he's basically just talking about um, basically me being a shill and, and a lot of other stuff. And, uh, you know, mistaking my intentions for a lot of my stuff. And so... I think it was on one of the treadle hammer kit videos that I was putting out. And yeah, he just took it to a deep, dark, personal place. And I was getting really angry at first. Again, uh, I was getting super angry and hot under the collar. So I ended up, uh, you know, I, I ended <laughs> I ended up deleting him from the channel. And now the, the reason why I did that at first, again, anger, probably to protect him from me more or less. And also to protect me from him. In, in a way, because we weren't seeing eye to eye. He was toxic for the channel. And what was it about for me? Why was it so unsettling? Why couldn't I just be a duck and let it roll off my back? Because it speaks to a fear that I always have. Um, you know, it speaks to that, maybe that monocle of truth I'm worried about, that that I will turn into somebody who's only here for the views, the clicks, the money, um, to sell you something, to somehow defraud um, people or my audience, and um, you know, and basically just kind of attack my faith and other things. And so those are really big things that I always worry about for myself. It's not something that, you know, I never started off Christ-centered ironworks to be anything for anyone besides myself. And so now that I'm very public and now that there's a channel presence of 87,000 people that follow us and there's like, there's all sorts of stuff on all sorts of social media. There's millions of views of our content worldwide, stuff like that. I never intended it ever to go that far, you know, never, ever in all of my life. I didn't, you know, I didn't plan on it ever going that way. It was actually Jessica who encouraged me to start doing some videos and sharing my work that way. And yeah, we've been over the history on that in the past. And before then, I was Roy Don't Do Buttons. I'm much more at home in the woods. I am much more at home being a mountain man than I am taking for sure. So, oh, drop me out there. Hopefully everybody's still around. But uh, anyways, enough of me waffling on. So, so yeah, um, so that's something I'm always out there on the lookout for. And I use, I use good, kind folks like Leland Ha. Um, uh, like Joe, I had a great conversation over the phone uh, with Joe uh, Mick Gillibray. <laughs> I had a great conversation with him and enjoyed him. We need more Joes in this world. We need more Leland Hawks in this world. We even need more Ben Toombs in this world, if you will. Um, <laughs> and Roger Caldwells and all of you good people. We, and, and, and Mr. Crawford, we need more Crawfords in this world. Um, you know, those, uh, that kind of admonishments for people and letting me know that I've had some uh, impact on them in some way. And I use me as in very lightly me. Um, that keeps me going. It really does. It, it really helps me kind of buffer those other people out of my mind. And, you know, it makes me happy to do it. That's what it is. It makes me happy to do it. it makes me continue to do it. And I'm going to keep being on YouTube until they kick me off, basically. Until they kick me off or everybody on here decides I'm not worth watching anymore. That's about it, you know. 
So, and the Stephen Parsons of the world, and the Wayne Heinz of the world. There's too many good dudes and too too many good gals here uh, to mention. All 30 of you. I don't know. Maybe there's a few haters in here waiting for the stream to be over. Blah. To blast me. Yep. Rotten art by DK. I do. I look at that. I look at that wall often. I look at that wall often. So. <laughs> Debaca maker. <laughs> That's funny. Anyways, um, I've walked long enough. I've got this bowl to where it needs to be. I need to take and paint it and and do all that tomorrow, I guess it will be. And, uh, you know, so, so I should probably get out of here. I should let you all go for this evening. Let you get to your weekends and stuff. Um, you know, yeah. Joe, yeah, good job, Jess. We need your content. Yeah, I, well, I greatly appreciate it. So I hope, I hope when it's all said and done, when I'm dead and gone someday, that I've had the opportunity to change someone's life out there. If I just change one person's life for the better, and I've helped some blacksmiths along the way that they just remember, and they tell the next guy, their apprentice, or whoever they're teaching later on in their life, that, you know, hey, I learned this trick from so-and-so, um, you know, if, if that transpires, then I say I've done a good job on YouTube, um, and it'll be worth it, you know, and it'll be all worth it, I guess. Um, I won't know, because I'll be, you know, on to a much greener pastures, but, you know, I hope that one day, when, when that happens, you know, I've had a big enough impact on people, uh, that, that I've done enough that, to make the Lord proud. That's what I hope. I hope I've made him proud when it's all said and done um, and hear that good and faithful servant thing. I don't know if we'll get there or not. Might be on the elevator ride down. You never know. <laughs> never know. Depends on what type of Roy uh, you're getting for the day. So um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping I'll be on the elevator ride up. But uh, yeah, fingers crossed, right? <laughs> So, all right, I got to shut up, get out of here before I get too sem sentimental and all that on camera. I don't like doing that. And uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for watching this, you know, this live stream and, uh, you know, hanging out with me on a late Friday night. So I, I really couldn't say any more about it. I really greatly appreciate each and every last one of you. So thank you for being here. Uh, we got some great content coming. Be sure to keep an eye out for it. And, uh, you know, God bless each and every last one of you and your families. And I look forward to catching you all on the next one. Bye, everybody. Take care. Let's see if I can end this now. The right way. <laughs>